Today, um, I'm going to introduce you to an interesting story that was published in the Greenfield Recorder Gazette um, on December 31st, 2003. And it was dedicated to the first person that died as a result of a plane crash. Now, um, it was, this is the story and I'm going to try to read it word for word. Though it went unmentioned and probably much unnoticed during the recent festivities at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, the centennial celebration of man flight marked not one but two milestones. Orville Wright's first flight on December 17, 1903, not only began the era of air travel in powered heavier than aircraft, it also marked the beginning of nearly five years in which not a single life would be lost in a plane crash, a span that's unmatched for the next 95 years. Granted, the skies weren't as crowded as they are today. Flights were separated by weeks and months rather than seconds, and commercial aviation was nothing but a distant dream. Yet it still seems remarkable that four years and 10 months would pass before on September 17, 1908, at Fort Myer near the Potomac, an airplane crash would claim its first victim. The pilot on that first fatal crash was Orville Wright. Not as surprising it might seem when the limited number of pilots at the time were taken into account. But Wright was not the victim. Though hospitalized for seven weeks with broken thigh, several broken ribs, and a back injury, serious cuts and bruises, Wright lived to fly again. Less fortunate was Wright's passenger, Lieutenant Thomas E. Selfridge, an aviation pioneer in his own right. Selfridge was one of five Army officers assigned to observe Wright in his airplane and recommend whether or not the War Department should move toward adding air power to its arsenal. Wright and Selfridge had been aloft for not quite five minutes that afternoon when a propeller malfunctioned and nicked a guide wire in the plane's rigging, sending the craft out of control. It plummeted about 200 feet into the packed earth of the Fort Myer um, parade ground. Selfridge, his skull fractured by the plane's engine, underwent emergency surgery, but died that evening without regaining consciousness. I know all this because Selfridge was my great uncle. My grandfather's kid brother he nearly died 50 years before I was born. And so um, here's a picture. It's not a good picture. It's dark. But um, he's posing with Alexander Graham Bell and other pioneers. Uh, Casey Baldwin, J.D. McCurdy at Bell's Estate on Cape Breton Island. But the stories of my Uncle Tom have been handed down through the generations. To me, his career embodied the paradox of human flight. It is a romantic, intriguing miracle of engineering, but it is also fraught with peril and should be avoided whenever possible. Selfridge, of course, would not share the darker half of my view of flying. By all accounts, he loved flying with a passion. A native of San Francisco, he graduated from West Point in the same year that the Wright brothers made their first flight. Within four years, he had persuaded the Army and President Theodore Roosevelt to attach him to a group that was performing aviation research in Nova Scotia under the direction of Alexander Graham Bell. Soon he was an expert on flying gliders, dirigibles, and airplanes. He was the most experienced and knowledgeable man in the Army when it came to aviation. And by the age of 36, no, 26, I'm sorry, he was dead. The fact that his first fatal air crash involved the world's preeminent pilot and took the life of another giant of early aviation always reminds me of one thing about aviation that will never change. No matter how safe flying becomes or how much skill and training the person at the controls possesses, it is still a long way down. We learned that again last week when scores died in a jet fi a diner crash in West Africa, 
and six Air France flights were canceled for fear they were going to be hijacked. There's no getting around it. The flying is a danger. Um, it just goes on to say things about things that were happening in, during that time. But then it says, for me, the ultimate irony associated with the short life and violent death of Lieutenant Thomas E. Selfridge is that doing what he loved and dying in the process, he helped to nurture the science of aviation that someday his sister's youngest grandchild could fly safely. Yet that grandchild still views flying with much the same terror and gripped hundreds of Washingtonians as they watched a fragile biplane plummet to earth 95 years ago. Now, this was written by, um, his name was Andy Moser, and he worked for the Washington Post.